the gap, standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap, one love for all So we all can make it in Standing in the gap, standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Studying to show ourselves approved Rightly to find the word of truth Increasing our faith to envision our freedom So we all can glorify our God Standing in the gap Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Make it in Make it in Make it in Want to hear him say good Good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord Wanna hear him say, good Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord Wanna hear him say, good and good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord Of the Lord, joy of the Lord Of the Lord, joy of the Lord Of the Lord Welcoming you to our Christian education program, Standing in the Gap. And um, it, we focus on some of the more difficult issues related to Christendom and uh, try to bring God's people back to God by standing on the gap. And the gap is the distance between God and his people that's developed as a result of sin. And unfortunately, our, our people are steadily moving away from God. <clears throat> so what we try to do is bring them back. Bring them back closer by the studies and by explaining some things that may be causing them to um, to stray away. But um, And we're here now on a study. It's called um, God is not dead. God's not dead. He's truly alive. Because a lot of people feel that God is no longer uh, either alive or, or relevant in their lives. And that, one, he never existed or he did exist and no longer does, which is crazy. But people don't feel that God is as relevant anymore. I guess that's one easy way to say it. Um, and so what we do and what we've been doing is proving the existence of God first through creation. That was the first part. And you can, the Bible says you can, uh, um, uh, you know that God exists because of what he has created. And when you look at what he's created, truly remarkable and fantastic and nothing that anybody else could and the power it would take to do that and all that. And the uh, scientific community is actually coming in line too in order to, um, uh, and, and to support, although that's not their, what they're trying to do, but, but what they're saying actually support. So we went into uh, showing you creation so that you'll understand all the physics and science and all that that points to God. And so we also are proving it in a different way too. If you look at John 1, 1 through 3, it says that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And later on it says the Word became flesh. 
and dwelt among us. Which, if 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 you trust and believe in that, that means that God and the Word, the Word being Jesus, are the same and are one. And so, the other way we prove that God is not dead is we prove the case for Christ, the existence of Christ, meaning that Christ is who He says He was. Um, and if we prove that, then we also prove that God is not dead. And that's where we are right now. We're in our study on um, the case for Christ. And it's a uh, very, very interesting study that requires that requires um, you to put your thinking caps on. That requires you to put your thinking caps on. So that's what I'm going to ask you to do. Because as we get things we get into today, are um, going to require you to, to do some thinking. And if you really want to understand this, I ask that you put those caps on. And um, as always, before we get into the actual study this week, we pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you, Father, for bringing us safely through these perilous times, Father, of pandemics and of uh, uh, people's anger and disagreements over political issues and and whether they should take a vaccine or not take a vaccine, whether they should wear a mask or not wear a mask, and whether they should beat up people who don't believe the same thing they do and all that kind of thing. We just thank you, Father, for for navigating us through this, Father, and, and uh, helping us to, to stay above the fray. So we want to thank you for that, Father. We also want, Father, you to, to send uh, comfort and Blessings to those who have lost loved ones. My daughter-in-law lost her father. And they'll be having his funeral tomorrow. We ask for your blessing on that. And one of the stalwarts in my uh, family tree down in Georgia, Cynthia Andrews, who uh, passed away suddenly. They're having her uh, memorial today. Life goes on, Father, we understand that. But some people are hurting and all that. We ask for you to give comfort to them in their time of mourning, Father. So, Father, we ask now that you open our hearts and open our minds as we jump into this study, Father. Help people understand what it is that you want them to have from this, Father. And as always, we give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Amen. Amen. All right. And as always, I want to introduce the person who uh, gets this uh, ball rolling every week and gets us on to our live broadcast and records our uh, broadcast and the outlines that uh, accompany the broadcast, uh, which I would have no idea how to do. And so uh, this is my wife, the love of my life, who is uh, as much a part of this as I am. Marvel, you got anything for me? Good morning, Saints. Good morning. Um, we are excited to talk about the case for Christ and um, show you all of the evidentiary procedures that uh, attorney Harmon, teacher Harmon, is going to be bringing us today. If you go to the chat, the live chat, there's a link in there so that you can join us live in the room. And also, you can um, get access to today's outline. There's a link to today's outline. So, Get ready, strap on your seat belts, and get ready for, like you said, your seat belts and your thinking caps, I guess. That's right. That's right. And uh, I, I usually don't go in too in-depth to the, a review of where we've gone, but I do want to talk about it a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but the uh, actual broadcast of the uh, previous session, you can find online and uh, pull those up, and that can catch you up on the live, you know video of where we've been and also the outlines are available to help you out and as always you can uh, anybody that has any questions um, you know you can do it on in the room uh, live as we go through this or you can contact us on our website and uh, we'll be happy to provide you with uh, what we can in reference to help you understand uh, God is not dead and so well but where we've been is that we um, we're studying the case for Christ, of course, as a um, as a study as I would in a case that I present in a court of law, whereby we would start out with uh, witnesses, witnesses, and um, 
a lot of people don't understand that we have uh, eyewitnesses for for Christ. And they're in the first four books of the Bible. You got Matthew and John, who were actual disciples, who tell you what they saw and experienced during the three year uh, ministry of Christ on earth. Then you have um, Mark, who was an associate of Peter, who relates to you what Peter told him. And then you have Dr. Luke, who uh, was an associate of Paul, who um, actually did investigation into talking to all the witnesses and people who had interaction with Jesus as he compiled his, uh, his gospel. He also wrote the uh, book of Acts, which is a history of the early church. So we, we actually have eyewitnesses and the uh, compilations of, of, of the eyewitnesses that have been reduced into writing. And so, just like in a court of law, we uh, would present you with these witnesses of, uh, of Jesus, his life, his, his uh, ministry, his sermons, and his miracles. And um, just like in a court of law, there's certain rules and regulations that, that, that we have to employ to test the accuracy and credibility of the witnesses. And just so to bring you uh, back to where we are right now, is that um, these uh, witnesses wrote down what the church has believed in from the beginning and what we believe in now to try to see if there uh, was is any in discrepancies and all that, meaning that it's been 2,000 years, okay, since over 2,000 years since Christ walked and these eyewitnesses saw and all that. So what you want to do, if you put a witness on, you want to have... Uh, some uh, compatibility with what um, what actually occurred and whether or not what they believed back in the first century after Jesus uh, lived or even closer to the time when he died and uh, what we believe now is it the same or has during that 2000 year period legend creeped in and mythology creeped in people making up stuff and filling in gaps with them they don't really have any uh, evidence to do that and so um just to give you a little um, emphasis of where we're coming from in that regard, a lot of people don't know that the Gospels were written, say, some say in the late 50s of the first century, which if Jesus died either 30 or 33 A.D., and they're pretty sure it's either 30 or 33 A.D. based upon the Passover, because that's, that's when he died. Um, you're talking about the actual writing down of Jesus' uh, life and, and his biography and all that within say 20 years less than 30 years from um, from from the actual event and that's your Matthew Mark Luke and John okay um, some of them are later they think Mark was the first one and uh, uh, but some people think that's the first time that Jesus life had been written down and people are aware of the epistles of Paul and all that and don't, uh, didn't know that the epistles came out before the Gospels were written down, somewhere around the 50s, 50s. So that's like less than, or about 20 years from the time that it happened. And then um, you find in those um, writings of, of Paul, he's the most prolific uh, uh, writer of those epistles, uh, epistles and the uh, books of the Bible, he he says that I was given certain things. And we know from doing further research that what he's talking about, he was given from the apostles, meaning given understanding of the life of Jesus and and the um, what Jesus did and the beliefs that of the early Christians to know if those beliefs are the same as the beliefs we see portrayed in the uh, epistles and in the Gospels. And so we know that... Uh, Within a year or two of the crucifixion, Paul had this encounter, Saul, Saul had an encounter with the risen Christ, which changed him from being a persecutor of Christians into probably the most famous apostle that, uh, of, the, of Christ and uh, started all those churches in the Roman Empire and Asia and all that, even in Rome and all that kind of thing, or at least uh, helped with that. And... Um, within two years of, of, the, of the resurrection. And so, he, uh, we also know from the scripture that he took 
after, after his uh, encounter on his way to Damascus with the risen Christ, that he went into study for, say, say a couple years, as you should. Everybody should study. But even the most famous apostle had to study. And which that's, that's, that's where we get understanding where we say, I'm giving to you what I was given. He's talking about his study, what he was given. And we say, your question might be, well, where did he get, who gave it to him, and when did he get it? Well, we know that after he went into the desert and studied under a certain uh, verse and all that, he came out and made a, uh, to Jerusalem and met with James, the brother of Christ, and with Peter, probably the most famous disciple. And then later on, he met with those same ones and with John. So they gave him certain things. And then when he was writing his epistle, you can look at um, uh, Philippians, he says, I'm giving you what was given to me. That was given to him at the most, at the most, five or six years after the resurrection. And it shows us what the Christians believed in within that period of time after the uh, crucifixion and the resurrection. And so the question is, was what he was given the same that we see in his uh, epistles and the same as we see in the Gospels. So we want to know what was what did they believe right after? Or did somebody come in and change the narrative, change the story? Well, one thing we, uh, we, we find when we look into that is that Paul talked about um, are included in his in his letter to the uh, uh, the Philippians. The um, a creed. What are creeds? Creeds are what you and I use um, when we try to remember something. We 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 remember it, and we kind of remember it so well that we can even sing it, you know, we, and all that. Well, the early Christians uh, in this society where there were no typewriters, no computers, or anything like that, they would um, come up with these creeds. They would sing it, and so we find the creed that he was given two years or four years, three to four years after the resurrection is what the early Christians were believing in. And they believed that uh, Jesus died, was a uh, rose on the third day, uh, um, and uh, appeared to the disciples and to over 500 and all that kind of thing, that he was God. And so it's been consistent right from the beginning. The beliefs that you see in the creeds that were given to Paul, the beliefs that you see in the letters that Paul wrote, the beliefs that you see in the Gospels. And we, in the Gospels, it's written there, and the question is, has it changed or anything like that? And basically, it has not. It has not. Now, you'll find that people will say, okay, that's fine. We got all these people writing all this stuff and all that, but... I don't think that it stands to scrutiny. I don't think that it can it can stand it if, if we put it to the test. And the thing about it is the scripture says, test the spirit. Don't just believe, which a lot of people do. They just, I believe, and that's fine. So long as you truly believe, that's fine. But then if uh, what will happen is, I truly believe this is what I believe, and somebody will come and they'll ask you questions and shake your understanding and all that, and sometimes even turn you away. From the word because you have no roots of your understanding so test the spirit whatever you do and that's what we do in this study we say test what spirit we're going to test the accuracy of, of these uh, so-called writers of the, of the gospels and, and uh, uh, what they wrote we're going to put it to the test because the same way we do we would do in a court of law okay that, I think that brings you up to where we are now. And as we move on, let's, let's talk about this evidence. <clears throat> what we are calling testing the eyewitness evidence. We're going to test it right here. So put your thinking caps on, put your seat belts on as we move down and, and, and stay with me. Because just like in a, in a court of law, I would put forth... Uh, eyewitnesses, but I also would put forth expert witnesses. And if you've been with us uh, before uh, in the previous classes, you understand that the first expert that I'm putting forward to you 
and that we have accepted as an expert is an individual by the name of Dr. Craig Bloomberg. Now, Dr. Bloomberg, um, and just so you don't just say I'm putting it forth because this picture, you should accept that. We put forth where he comes from, his education, his training, his publications, his membership. And if you read through all that, I don't think you'll have any uh, doubt that this individual would be accepted as an expert in a court of law. And like I said, we have presented this uh, previously, and we're, we're uh, accepting Dr. Bloomberg as an um, expert. Now, so that you understand where Dr. Bloomberg comes from and all that, I've asked uh, Marvel to key up a uh, video, and we'll, we'll meet Dr. Bloomberg, and we'll find out what Dr. Bloomberg has to say. Many people in our world today wonder whether the New Testament Gospels uh, are historically reliable. In this brief talk, I want to raise and address five points very briefly as a kind of a teaser uh, for uh, the claim that uh, they can be trusted. The first question that we have to ask is, did the authors of those four Gospels want to record reliable history? We can answer that affirmatively because Luke's first four verses uh, are written in a very similar style to what we find in the prefaces and opening paragraphs of other ancient histories, whether it be Josephus's late first century Jewish history or uh, pre-Christian Greek writers like Herodotus or Thucydides. It doesn't, of course, mean that uh, everything Luke did was successful, but it gives us a clue as to his intentions. So that leads to a second question. Were the gospel writers able? Were they in a position to preserve reliable history? Even the most conservative dates for the earliest gospel, probably Mark, uh, are no earlier than the late 50s or early 60s of the first century. But this was an age of an oral culture when school children memorized large uh, epic narratives, Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey, in Jewish circles, a large part of the Hebrew scriptures, and even the longest of the Gospels, the Gospel of Luke, not quite 20,000 words, uh, is comparatively short uh, related to the types of things that ancient uh, people could memorize. But then thirdly, did they actually succeed in doing so? This is a, a question that's almost impossible to answer in uh, a brief few thoughts, other than to say, that one of the keys to understanding that they did is to judge them by first century standards. We often impose modern scientific levels of precision on ancient sources that uh, those people could never have imagined would someday be invented. As just one illustration, the quotation mark had yet to be invented in any of the ancient languages of the biblical cultures, nor was there any felt need for it. So we have to remember when we read the Gospels, whether it's Jesus or some other character being quoted, that uh, first of all, this is a translation in most cases from Aramaic that they would have spoken into Greek, and secondly, that the writers felt free to put things completely in their own words as long as they were being faithful to the gist of what was said. But fourthly, we have to ask, once the Gospels were written, were they reliably preserved? We have over 5,700 ancient Greek manuscripts uh, of part or all of the New Testament from before the invention of the printing press. We have a couple hundred from the earliest centuries of the Christian era alone. And the amount of differences uh, among the manuscripts are, compared to any other ancient documents that we have, uh, quite negligible. 
the really interesting differences are printed in footnotes uh, or marginal references in modern English translations of the Bible, and modern readers can see them. It's sometimes been said that there may be uh, several hundred thousand variants, but those are spread over thousands of manuscripts, and the vast majority just affect spelling. But finally, what about the plethora of modern translations? We have uh, highly literal translations. We have very free, what are called dynamically equivalent translations. Probably the best kind is what has been called optimally equivalent, that uh, like the NIV, for example, aims in each passage to be as faithful to the original meaning and as clear and intelligible as possible at the same time. In some passages, one of those has to take a little preference over the other. But all a person needs to do is get a computer program or a selection of hard copies of a dozen or so of the major modern translations and randomly pick a text, and you will see how really similar they all are. Thank you, Dr. Bloomberg. And you know, let's get into this. We're not just going to accept these uh, gospels as what <clears throat> what was written. We want to know if they stand the test of scrutiny. Now, um, and how do we go about that? Well, let's 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 uh, let's see here. Let's ask some questions. These are witnesses who wrote down these gospels. Did they have the ability to actually view what happened? You know, when I get in court and <clears throat> we have witnesses and I cross-examine witnesses, uh, one of the things that I cross-examine them on is, did they have the ability to actually view what they're saying that they saw? You find some people who were um, uh, somewhere and they heard something, okay? And then they'll tell you what, they, what happened. And you say, well, did you actually see that? Where were you? Well, I was upstairs in my... In my uh, in my office, I heard this sound, and then when I looked down there, I saw somebody laying on the ground, and I and I saw somebody standing near them, and uh, that's the person that did it. And you say, well, wait a minute. You didn't actually see that, right? <laughs> no, and you're actually um, just assuming some things, right? And, I mean, that's what you have to get out of these eyewitness testimonies. Were they there? How far away were they? Do they have good eyesight? Did you have your glasses on, sir? You always ask when somebody has their um, an automobile accident, you'll find out that on the license it says whether you should be wearing your glasses at this time or not. And you find, well, no, I didn't have them on. Well, then that that draws your uh, testimony into uh, 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 disrepute because now you've opened the door and I can argue all day that he didn't really see anything. He can't see. <laughs> <laughs> or a person I heard this and they're like 800, 800 yards away how could you have heard that sir you know and I saw somebody and um, that's the person right there who did it and you say well uh, have you ever seen that person before no how far away were you when you looked at it well he had long hair you know and he had glasses on and this is this same gentleman here right here and what you find out is that they didn't really they don't really know what they saw so you test it. Did they have the ability to view what happened? And then what about the inconsistencies between uh, what they saw and what the evidence showed? You know how you, they do with the uh, uh, C, excuse me, CSI. They gather all the evidence and all that kind of thing. And then the witness will come in. I saw this happen and all that. Said, well, sir, that couldn't happen because we're looking at the scene and we didn't find anything that relates to what you're saying. What you're doing is testing that evidence. And if there are inconsistencies, what you, most people won't believe what you're saying. If, if, and let's say there are two eyewitnesses and their, their stories don't come together. It's inconsistent. Most people say, I don't know what to believe. You know, That's the kind of thing you do when you, when you scrutinize the, uh, the eyewitness testimony. And also, what about the character of the witness? Now, there are some people who you that you just can't believe a word they say. Why? Based on their history. And so if you can show that this person has a character flaw or whatever, then 
you can uh, assume or at least start to open the door to uh, discrediting their testimony because maybe this person um, has a character flaw. What's your character flaw, sir? Well, um, yeah, I've been I've been convicted of uh, child abuse and and uh, sexual misconduct and all that kind of thing, but I'm here to testify as to the morals of this person. <laughs> <laughs> And, and with that type of character, his reliability goes out the window. So we're going to test these Gospels as to the character of the actual eyewitness, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, and uh, Peter. And are they biased? Are they biased? You'll find some people who believe what they're saying, but their belief is based upon their bias. You say, well, what is that? Well... Just for example, when you go down uh, through history, back in the Old South and all that, when um, uh, somebody testified as to what a black person did, and they're, they're a white person who, who don't like black people and think that black people are less than human and all that kind of thing, they're biased. Their account of what they saw or heard or whatever is influenced by their bias. So one of the things you have to do when you uh, scrutinized testimony is see if there's any biases and you bring that out and do the and actually do the eyewitnesses actually know the difference between a truth and a lie and you say well sure everybody does well everybody should but one thing we do with uh, we don't really allow children of much tender age to testify as a witness in court why because a lot of times they don't really understand the difference between truth and falsity and they their testimony becomes useless because they they make up stuff or they don't know this and that and, and feel it's okay to do that and you say um okay well okay children i could understand what about someone what about someone who's incompetent where their mind is not right and all that kind of stuff and they they testify their their testimony becomes unreliable also and you say okay these are the ways we're going to scrutinize these gospels huh I told you, put on your thinking cap, and I want you to think through this with me as we proceed down to uh, find out how we go, how we're gonna test these witnesses. Now, there are eight tests that we use in when we're um, um, to underscore strengths of testimony and weaknesses of testimony. We're gonna go through them pretty quickly here. Um, first one. Is called the intention test. When you're looking at a witness or whatever, you say, was it his stated or implied intention to accurately preserve history? And so we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They wrote these things down. Was it their stated or implied intention to accurately do it? That's very important. That's very important. Some people just like to write stuff because they like to write stuff and they hope everybody like what they write and all that kind of stuff. So they're not even uh, uh, concerned about accurately writing history. This is not a history uh, a thing I'm writing. This is just something that I, uh, I want people to have fun and reading and all that kind of thing. Well, that's what you do for like your Dr. Seuss books and all that kind of thing. <laughs> but, but if you're wanting to look at the um, accuracy of preserving history, okay, the intention test. This test determines whether it was the stated or implied intention of the writer to accurately preserve history. So let's look at the uh, Luke, okay? The Gospel of Luke. And you can go to Gospel of Luke first. At the right the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. In the first four um, verses of the Gospel of Luke, where he explains what his purpose is in writing this thing. Many have undertaken to draw upon an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Talking about Jesus and his, his ministry. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. The word. Remember the word? Uh, Luke. And a lot of you, you know, a lot of people read through the Gospels they, and they, they pass over things like this. Because this, this isn't the meat of the thing. He's just making some statements. Let me get down to these miracles and all that kind of thing. Well, as we're looking at to the accuracy of these things, was it his uh, stated or implied um, desire to accurately 
put down in word what he saw or what he uh, his interviews revealed. He says it was just as they were handed down to us. So that means he was trying to do it as accurately as possible. And he got it from those who were the first, meaning the ones who walked with Jesus, who talked with Jesus, and were eyewitnesses and servants. And servants of the word meaning that meaning that they were dedicated. They were dedicated to Jesus. So he took it upon himself to uh, make an account. And, and remember what I said about Luke? Luke, Luke, Luke was an investigator. He was a doctor. He was a learned man. Now, that, you can't say that about everybody back, back in that day. But most of them were illiterate. Okay? He was, a, he was a doctor. He was learned. So he knew how to investigate, write stuff down, and ask questions and all that kind of thing. And so we go to the next part of that. He said, with this in mind, since I myself, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. It means he was thorough. Okay, and he was careful about it. I too decided to write an orderly account. Everybody, other people were writing things. He says, I did mine based on investigation and all that. He wasn't a disciple. But I take that back. He wasn't one of the 12. We know there were more disciples than 12. Okay, um, and I write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theo. The Ophilus, which is basically the people he's writing it to. And at this time, of course, he's writing to Jews. So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Gospel of Luke, right at the beginning, it's his purpose to, to, to um, write an accurate description and preservation of the history of the life of Jesus. Mm. All right, now let's go to Gospel of John. Well, we know what Luke said. Look, what did John say? John 20, 30, and 31 said, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples. Basically what he's saying is, I wrote about the things that, um, uh, or I put in writing here, things I thought were, you know, of dramatic importance to you, but there were many other signs that Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, meaning miracles, right? which are not recorded in my book that I'm writing. But they are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, what, what, what is very important about these Gospels is that these, these people are writing this in an in a effort to accurately preserve what it was that had occurred, the events and all that. And so that's one of the tests of reliability. That was their intention to do that. All right. Now, we're going to go through this as, and, you know, try to do it as, I guess, um, clearly as possible, where we have our uh, expert, Dr. Bloomberg. We also are testing it. So we have the, uh, you might call the antagonists. Okay, in this case is uh, Mr. Strobel who wrote the book on the um, case for Christ. And understand, Strobel wrote the book in an effort to try to prove that Jesus didn't exist, that it was all a lie and all that kind of thing. And so he's 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 not just accepting what these ex this expert is saying. And that's going to be the way it's going to be presented as we go through the other experts and all that. So um, when you look at the writings of uh, the gospel. You, you look at the style of the writings. Style of the writings. See, the gospels are written in a sober and responsible fashion. If you read through them, a sober and responsible fashion. It's, it's not just crazy stuff when you read it. It makes sense. Written with accurate incidental details which show obvious care and exactitude, meaning that you have the main stuff it's writing about, but also writes about little details and descriptions and all that kind of thing. And, um, the, and it's found out that these incidentals are accurate also. And, and what that shows is that they were trying, obviously trying, to be as accurate and exact as possible when they were writing these things. Now, when you compare that to other ancient writings, uh, which tend to have outlandish flourishes and, you know, about uh, uh, things that happen like, you know, this, 
this uh, lady with snakes coming out of her head and all that kind of thing appeared upon the scene, or this giant with one eye and all that showed up and all that. Uh, you don't have that kind of stuff in your stuff that's uh, that crazy stuff. See, because those other ancient writings, and, and we're comparing the gospel with other ancient writings because uh, the world accepts a lot of these other ancient writings, but not the not the scriptures, the gospels, and uh, we find out that the gospels are much more reliable than what they believe happened uh, in ancient times, years and years ago. Now, um, the other ancient writings tend to have outlandish flourishes and blatant mythology. mythology. And Dr. Bloomberg, our expert, he concludes that the goal of the gospel writers was to attempt to accurately record what actually happened. That's important. And the first trying to figure out the reliability of it. Well, let's see what Mr. Strobel, our antagonist, has to say. He said, well, did they really accurately record the events? He says, because early Christians were convinced that Jesus was going to return during their lifetimes. So, there was no incentive on them to preserve any historical records about Jesus' life and ministry. Why? Why should we write this down? He's coming back. He'll be back in a few days, a few years, or whatever. So, we don't need to write it. He said, so, uh, they believed that the men, when they realized that he wasn't coming back, they had no accurate historical material to draw upon in writing the Gospels. Because they didn't write it down at first. Because they believed he was coming back. So after when they figured about 80 or 90 AD, well, I guess he ain't coming back. Uh, while I'm alive, we better write this stuff down. Now their memories, they may not remember everything. Details and all that kind of thing. Bloomberg, our, our, our uh, expert uh, uh, comes back and he says actually Jesus is teaching presupposes a significant amount of time before the end of the world. You see people uh, uh, may have been hoping that Jesus will come right back but when you look into the, uh, the actual scriptures you'll find out that Jesus' writing say, don't say he's coming right back. Okay? The end of the world is when I'm coming. And the end of the world is projected to be down the line. As we all hope it's way down the line. <laughs> but, but early Christians, Bloomberg says early Christians were Jews, okay, who were used to hearing the prophets proclaim certain things about the day of the Lord. I know as you read through the scripture, you'll see where it says the day of the Lord is coming and all that, which is basically a reference to the time of the end of the world, okay? And um, and they would always say, the day of the Lord is upon us. And then finding out that the day of the Lord was not actually upon them, they still recorded, uh, valued, and preserved the words of the prophets, okay? Even though it didn't happen. And we're talking about the Jews, okay? Now, Jesus was seen as being even greater than the prophets. So it's very reasonable that the early Christians would have at least done the same thing, if not more, for his teaching as the Jews would do for the other prophets, you would think. Okay? So that argument that uh, uh, of, of, of the uh, antagonist doesn't hold water. Early Christians believed that the physically depart, uh, according to our antagonist, early Christians believed that the physically departed Jesus spoke through them with messages or prophecies for the church. You know, what's that mean? Well, that means that the early witnesses or the early, or anybody that saw or whatever Jesus at the time would have in their mind what they saw. But then they believe Jesus spoke to them after he died through them. So they got a mixture of what I saw and what Jesus is talking to me about and all that. So how can we accurately uh, how can we actually believe that what they're writing down is actually what they saw? Or was it com uh, 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 commingled with what they say Jesus is talking to them about? These speakings or prophecies that the uh, early Christians believed were, were considered just as authoritative as Jesus' words during his lifetime. So he's saying they didn't distinguish between the two. So how do we know 
how can we know if the things they eventually wrote down were Jesus' original statements or these after-death prophecies that they were getting from Jesus? And in essence, what they're saying is that the Gospels are a blend between the two. And what we want to know is what did you actually see, not what you felt somebody was talking to you about. Because it could be the devil talking to you. <laughs> well, our expert doesn't buy that uh, criticism. Of course, the early Christians were very careful to distinguish between the actual words of Jesus and their and their prophecies. And you see that in the writings of Paul. If you go to 1 Corinthians 7, um, it says, I say this as a concession, not as a command, meaning that he's making a distinction. And in verse 10, he says, to the married. And remember, I, I, I remember he's talking to the married and to the people not married and all that kind of thing, where he says that... Um, to the married, I give you this command. And he said, uh, not I, but the Lord gives you this command. He distinguished that in there. And then, verse 12, he says, and to the rest of you, I say this. I'm saying this to you, not the Lord. So, so Paul was very careful in not blending what, what uh, he felt Jesus was, was saying to him from what he actually interpreted and what he thought should be done. And all that based upon his studies and all that kind of thing. So that uh, criticism that, you know, they were just saying what, what they thought they were getting from Jesus after he died with what they saw and all that, it doesn't hold water. Also, the Jews and the Christians had a test for these prophecies that you claim you're getting from Jesus after he died. And it's, it's one of the most uh, uh, clear tests that I have ever seen. And he said, all right, this prophecy. How do we test whether uh, this prophecy? Well, my first thing is, did it come true? <laughs> Somebody said that something's going to happen and all that, and it came true. Okay, well, that's a true prophecy. But if it never comes true, you know, <laughs> I'm not going with you on that one. And do these new statements that you claim that you're getting from Jesus after he died, the new uh, inspiration and all that, do they actually comport with what Jesus actually said and believed? Because, see, that's the way of you knowing where you get where this this word is coming from. And people say things like, "Okay, Jesus said that um, uh, uh, you can have uh, adultery in your heart." He said that, right? He said that. So, what if the new uh, person says, "I just heard from Jesus that um, that's not true." Oh, well, come on now. You know, I can't believe you on that one. It's also important as to what is not found in the Gospels, and this is important, because there are many controversies, there were many controversies in the early church, which persisted for quite some time. As you understand, you got the church is growing, it's in its infancy and all that. And then you have, you're bringing in these Jews, who were the first ones, then you're bringing in these uh, uh, Gentiles, that's, that's going to be difficult because Gentiles believe a whole certain set of things that uh, uh, Jews don't even believe. And now the Christians are having their, their slam on it and all that. So you have people arguing back and forth as to what we should actually believe, what should we should actually do, and all that kind of thing. You see, um, it would have been real easy to simply prophesy them away to, get, to uh, resolve these controversies just saying, well, you know, I'm receiving this prophecy now from the part of Jesus, and this answers your question and answers this and answers that. That would have been real easy, but they didn't do that. See, they were interested in distinguishing between what happened in Jesus' lifetime and what was later debated in the church. Okay, and You'll find out throughout the history of not only Christianity, but Islam and all that, there are different debates that go on. You know that? So, um, you won't find in the Gospels anything that uh, of these uh, 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 controversies, meaning that uh, trying to resolve those differences. They're not trying to resolve those differences uh, by means of prophecy. Okay. Now, that's that test. What about any other test? The ability test. 
Were the gospel writers able to reliably record history? Were they able to do it? Were they, uh, Strobel, our expert says, I'm sorry, not our expert, our antagonist, antagonist, says, how can we be sure that the material about Jesus' life and teaching was well preserved for the 30 years before it was actually written down? It was 30 years before it was actually written down. And that in that 30 years, faulty memories could be a problem. Any gaps in memory could simply be filled in by the writer's own imagination. I mean, that's, that's, that's good possibly. You see, dementia patients, anybody that's had to deal with a dementia patient who's losing their memory and all that, they have fragments of memory and all that, and they'll say, they'll fill it in. Because they, they realize they don't understand that, right? And so they'll say, well, this actually happened. And you know, as their, as their son, daughter, wife, or whatever, that ain't true, you know? One thing, one thing about the dementia patients who fill that in, if you challenge them on it. <laughs> That's got, really the truth. <laughs> you have got a fight on your hands. Because what you, see, because by what you're doing, you're challenging that you are confirming that you don't know what you're doing, you're losing your memory and all that, and they fight that. They, that's why they fill in the gaps, because they're trying not to lose their memory. And so, but in any event, um, the antagonist says that after over 30 years, they, their memory might be faulty, and as they're writing this down, they start to fill in the gap. Wishful thinking could be a problem. And then uh, the development of legend could in, in, uh, invade into the actual reality. And you say, legend? Oh, yeah, like Billy the Kid and, and Jesse James and uh, uh, all that. Whereby, you look at Billy the Kid now, he, he's got a legend of being a famous guy and all this. And people write stories and books about him and all that. He was a common criminal. <laughs> he was a murderer. He was a thief. <laughs> Jesse James was a, uh, uh, a Southern sympathizer and uh, an outlaw who stole and money and all that, killed people and all that. And the legend is that he was stealing from the poor, I mean, from the rich and giving to the poor. That's crap. But that has seeped into the story about them. And in, in, in our society, in the books and movies and things, they actually are, are portrayed as uh, responsible people. They turn from criminals into heroes mm -hmm. through the false legends. Exactly. So you want to be careful that in when the gospel writers were writing these gospels, that they didn't allow any legend to get in, involved in that. See, ancient culture was basically an oral culture. So for the 30 years before anything got written down, that's, that's the uh, basis of the argument of the antagonist. The story would have been preserved by word of mouth, okay? Now, rabbis were very, very uh, famous for committing the entire Old Testament to memory. The entire. I mean, it was word for word. It was, it was oral. And so they had everything written down. So you had to rely upon the, uh, their memories. And, and remember, rabbis were Jews. The early Christians were Jews. So they don't have any problem with trying to accurately remember stuff because that's their background. Early Christians could have, could have, could have easily committed even more than what is recorded in the, in the Bible to memory and pass it along accurately, just as they're used to with the Old Testament. Now, this kind of memory seems incredible to us because we're some lazy people. Let me tell you. <laughs> Whenever you can't we, even remember okay. nobody's telephone any uh, telephone number anymore. <laughs> I tell you, and 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 really, our education and upbringing, we don't really put a whole bunch of emphasis on memorizing word for word and verse for verse and all that. But that's because we can write it down, we can put it in, in we can Google it and on our phone and all this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. They mm -hmm. didn't have that ability back then, so to them, they. They memorized it. And the memory that, that, that you have is, is much stronger than we ever used. They used it back then. We don't use it now. Um, but it was necessary in early times. And i give you one example. You remember the story of Roots, the Roots story. And uh, John, uh, what's his name? Uh, Alex Haley. Yeah, Alex Haley. 
and he uh, was searching for his roots and all that kind of thing. And you know that I do a lot of family history and all that kind of stuff. And it is very difficult to go back for black people to a certain point. Okay. Now he was able to, um, as the story goes, able to go across to where he knew his ancestor came from, and um, to that to that tribe, and ask questions about. Uh, I'm, I'm here asking questions about Kunta Kinte, um, who lived about, I don't know, three or four hundred years before you, and this is a tribe, right? And I w I'd like to look into your uh, libraries and your and your uh, records and stuff to see if there was actually a Kunta Kinte in it. You crazy. We ain't got all that. All we got is oral history. Oral history. And they called the people who kept the oral history... Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so if you remember the movie, Haley's sitting there all this time listening to this guy, and 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 the thing about the memory is, as, as with computers, we can say I want to start here at this time. They can't do that. Mm -mm. They start from the beginning, and they take you this happened, this happened, this happened. That's that's their memory. This happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. So he's sitting there saying, oh my goodness, I got to go through 400 years of history here <laughs> and all that. And he finally found, uh, as he was about, looked like on the movie, he was about to go to sleep listening <laughs> to all that. And he said, Kunta went out to make a drum or something and never came back. You old African, I found you. That's a griot. That's oral. That's oral history. Well, you know, um, before the onset of the printing press and way before computers and typewriters and all of that, that was the acceptable way of storing and transferring history. Mm -hmm. And there were people in every culture back then mm -hmm. that that was their responsibility. They had a talent and a skill for that memorization. And they remembered, like you said, the whole Old Testament mm -hmm. or the whole whatever. And it was, it was, in poetry and song, which made it easier for them to continue that recitation. Exactly. And so that's what we're talking about here, is that for, um, let's say, the 30 years of the, uh, of, 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 of the New Testament or the Gospels, before they were actually written down, that's how it would have been done. That's how it would have been done. The Jews did it. Africans did it. The whole world did it. The mm -hmm. whole world did it. Now, they say that 80 to 90 percent of Jesus' words were, as you indicated, in poetic form, whereby the meter, the balance lines, and uh, parallelism would have helped memory. Example, how we remember words to songs actually accurately after years have passed. If you look at your kid, they can probably uh, tell you the exact words of a lot of these rap songs and all that kind of thing and all that because of it's done in poetic form. It's done to music and all that. Ask me about some old school music that I learned when I was very little. I give you word for word accurately. <laughs> but here's an even better example of it. When my daughter Epiphany was a baby, I mean literally two years old, mm -hmm. I, I bought it. A song. I bought a song that was personalized for her. Epiphany Davis is my name. I live in Loveland, Ohio, at 218 on Wildwood Court with my family. My mm. birthday is November 3rd in 1989. I know my telephone number too, 5839941. Now, I learned that song 30 years ago. Epiphany learned it, well, 28 years ago. She knows that song still. And that's all the information. And, and, and I was so proud of myself and of her because when she was three years old, if she got lost in the store, they say, you know, what's your phone number? She could tell them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is a, that's a powerful example of how that works. Exactly. All right. And uh, oral cultures felt free to, to, to bury the story on a given occasion by including certain things, excluding third certain things, paraphrasing, and explaining, okay? That doesn't take it up away from the accuracy of it. 
However, there were checks and balances to ensure that the true meaning of the word was wording was preserved. Why is that? Because they say these, let's say this griot, he says, he says this stuff all the time. People always listen. And people are listening. And then if he says something wrong, <laughs> they correct him wrong. Of course, the griots were uh, very, very skilled and they, they, they didn't say much wrong. But what that means is that there's a check and balance for oral history. And a lot of times you're you're saying things that people know. If you say it wrong, they will they will correct you on it. So that's the ability test. Were they were the gospel writers able to reliably record history before it was written down through this oral process? Answer is obviously yes, they were. Yes, they were. Then there's the character test. Was it in the character of the writers of the gospel to be truthful? Is there any evidence of dishonesty or immorality that might taint their ability or willingness to transmit history accurately? There is no evidence that the gospel writers were of bad character. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As a matter of fact, the only evidence we have is that they were of good character. Remember, Jesus trained these people, or these people he trained trained these people, and held them to an exacting as exacting a standard of integrity as any religion ever had. You look at what Jesus said. He held you to up here. And he trained them to hold it up here. And uh, they trained their people to hold it up here. So there's no evidence of character flaws in that. Um, integrity was a part of their being. And these people were willing. And here's, here's the other thing. Uh, these people were willing to live their beliefs, what they believed. And you know they believed it. Well, how do we know they believed it? Because they believed it to the point of being put to death for that belief. How many of you would uh, allow yourself to be put to death for something you knew was wrong? I didn't see any hands at all. How many would risk their lives for something lives for something they know was a lie. All right. Then we have what we call the consistency test, whether the gospel writers had any biases that could have colored their work. Our antagonist says, critics of the Bible, of the gospel, feel that they are hopelessly contradictory with each other and irreconcilable and therefore can't be trusted. A lot of people believe that. I really didn't see, I read, read Mark, it didn't seem to come with what I see in John or, or uh, Luke or whatever. Our expert says there are numerous points that seem to disagree, but once you allow for paraphrasing, abridgment, everybody see the abridged work of so-and-so, that's just a shortened version or condensed form of a book that still retains the basic uh, contents of it, abridged. Because some people don't want to read a thousand pages, they only want to read 200. You find that they are extremely consistent with each other by ancient standards. And the problem that people, when they want to uh, criticize uh, uh, the Bible, is that we criticize it based on 21st century standards. We have to analyze this according to the standards in place at the time as to what, why they did this and why they did that. Um, and then understand this. Um, too much consistency is a problem. And we get in court and we got three people come in to, to give testimony. They all say the same thing. They say the same. You use the same words and pauses and all that kind of thing. And that's a problem. That becomes unreliable because it, it shows evidence that they got together. And sometime over here, they and got their colluded. stories together. Yeah, they all got the same story together. Right. Perfect consistency among a number of persons smacks of a derived story. Inconsistencies actually show no prior collaboration and reinforce the conclusion that they are independent narrations of the same event. Same event. So if you have in the Gospels, you'll see uh, it written this way, this, this happened this way. There were, there were two angels here, and one of them says, an angel did this. doesn't say two. They says one, and they say, well, that's inconsistent. No, it's not. It's not. Why, why isn't it? Because 
he didn't say there weren't two. <laughs> he commented on the one. Why? Because I'm writing this and you're not writing this. <laughs> Agreement on basic data and divergence on details suggests credibility. Suggest because a fabricated a fabricated account tends to be fully consistent and harmonized. Now, our antagonist says, uh -uh, "I got you on this one. Let's let's go to Matthew eight five thirteen. And if you see a centurion talking to Jesus, Matthew eight five thirteen is where." Is the centurion asked Jesus to heal his servant. You remember that story? Mm -hmm. um, Luke recounts the same event. And it says, uh, the centurion sent the elders to talk to Jesus. They said, well, that's a discrepancy. One says Jesus, he, 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 he personally talked to Jesus. The other said he sent the elders to do that. Our expert said, well, that's not really a contradiction. They said, why? Compared examples of statements of presidents that were written by speech writers and delivered by press secretaries but attributed to the president. They do that all the time. You look at Jan Psaki or whatever. When she says, they ask her a question about Biden and all that. Now, after that, it's not her speaking anymore. This is what Biden said, even though it came through her. Now, in the ancient world, acts are attributed to people when, in fact, they occurred through subordinates or emissaries or, in this case, through the Jewish elders. So even though the Matthew says the centurion asked, the centurion is the one who's asking. It was just delivered by the elders. Uh, and, and using the elders uh, is probably exactly what happened here. Why? Because Jews rarely consorted with Romans. So you wouldn't see a uh, Jew talking to a Roman. You do it to a subordinate. And this guy, by talking to Jesus, asking him to save his servant, is conceding that Jesus has this power and all that, which is totally against what Romans believe and all that kind of thing. And uh, so I take and say, well, what about this one? You, know, you, you can probably tell what this is about, right? All the pigs jumping into the water. You remember the legend, uh, legion? The, right, uh, right, of uh, demons. Yeah, all the demons in him and Jesus uh, exercised and threw it into these pigs. And all these pigs ran off crazy and killed themselves by jumping into the water. All right. Well, that was Matthew. I mean, Mark 5, 120 and Luke 8, 26, 39 say this happened in a place called Gerasa. Matthew talks about that story and says that it was Gadara. And we know those are two different places. So, ah, oh, there's, there's a, that's a problem. Well, uh, our expert says, well, let me give you a possible explanation for that. Because we're trying to figure out what the uh, um, what what places were thousands of years ago. He says one was a town and the other was a province. Okay, well that's two different things. Well, but one is in one. Archaeologists have mm -hmm. excavated a town at the exact place where this event occurred and found that its name seems to be Karasa, as it says in 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 the uh, scripture it says Karasa, Karasa. But when it was, uh, whose spelling in Greek was rendered Gerasa in the province of Gadara. Hmm. And he said, okay then, what about the genealogies of Matthew and Luke? Our antagonist says, our, our, our expert says, Matthew 1, 1 through 17 reflects Joseph's lineage, if you remember the lineage of Joseph. Mm-hmm. Most of the opening chapters told from Joseph's perspective. Joseph is the adoptive father and legal ancestor from whom Jesus' royal lineage is traced, which theme is important to Matthew's gospel. Understand, this was a society that always gave the benefit to the male. Okay, so as as if you're looking for Jesus' genealogy, a lot of them don't want to hear from Mary. Okay, um, if you go to Luke 3.23, Luke 3.23 seems to take it from the perspective of Mary. Okay? And they say they both are in the line from um, King David. So, obviously, go back in time and trace their lines back. At some point, they're going to converge. <laughs> so that the line is, is still a line from Jesus to 
And by this time, our antagonist is a little upset. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting a little frustrated. <laughs> All right, now we've uh, we've gone through a number of these tests, and uh, we we've, we've reached about the time that we allow for these things. And so we'll pick that up later. You can uh, you can get the outline from the um, from from the uh, uh, online, and then we'll start next week with the bias test as we go through these tests as we're trying to test the accuracy of the uh, of the uh, gospels. And that's why I want you to keep your thinking caps on, okay? Because, you know, if, if, if you just want to skim the surface of this, then you're really not going to get the understanding that you need. So we'll uh, pick that up there. And Marble, you got anything as we... Uh, no, I don't out? have anything else. I was trying to get all of us uh, from the room onto the uh, screen at the same time along with you, because we have Sister Monica here, and uh, happy belated birthday, Sister Monica. We, uh, I hope you had a great and wonderful birthday. You guys say anything? Thank you. Along with you, because we have Sister Monica here. All right. Well, um, I'm going to flip it back over to Art. had a great and wonderful birthday. You guys say anything? All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoy your holiday weekend. Um, be careful. There is a, uh, a, a virus out there that is uh, causing havoc out there. Do your masking. Do your uh, uh, distancing. Even though you're vaccinated, I don't have to do all this stuff. Well, you know what? That, vac uh, that virus breaks through sometimes, that uh, vaccination. And then you can even carry it and... Um, infect other people because I mean how many Marvel what percentage of our uh, people in the United States are vaccinated uh, almost 70 mm -hmm. so, there's a bunch so they're of 30 percent are not that fully vaccinated almost 70 percent are fully vaccinated in the US but you look at some places like uh, Mississippi and uh, Alabama, they're they're under forty percent, you know, thirty six percent, and things like that, and and hence why their hospitals are overrun with COVID, and mm -hmm. uh, people are trying to get a you know some other kind of life saving surgery that they need can't get it because the hospital is all filled up with COVID COVID patients. But uh, like up here in Ohio, we're more around sixty something, mm -hmm. but then our COVID. Um, infection rates have have actually skyrocketed too, mm -hmm. and people are getting exposed and they're getting infected. Even if they have the vaccine, they're not getting so sick, they're not dying, but they're infected and they can pass it on to someone else who, who is does get who, sick and does die. Exactly. And especially our children are now being uh, uh, more represented in hospitals and all that. Oh, it's terrible so. what's happening with the kids. You know. Uh, the statistic I heard is that more children have died of COVID in 2021 already this year than in the worst flu epidemic that we've ever had. Well, not counting back in 1918, but mm -hmm. the worst flu year for kids. Mm -hmm. So people are like, well, it doesn't affect the children that badly. But if that was your child that got sick and died, you'd, you'd have a different idea about that. Absolutely. So be careful. Have fun, but be careful. Um, there's still a lot that's going on out there. So, um, all right, let us pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you, Father, for the for the evolving um, study that we're involved in, Father. Open our hearts, open our minds, Father. Help us put our thinking caps on. Help us put our reasoning caps on. And understand that the importance of this study is for those who may have to recount to others that 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 may have to justify or to others their belief or have their belief stand the criticism of others that God is not dead, that the case for Christ has been made. So, Father, we ask you to to bless this study, bless all those who are able to tune into this. Live. Bless all those who will will look at it at a later time online. 
So I ask this all, I ask this all in your name and for your sake. Amen. Amen. Gap, standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Standing in the gap Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap one love for all, so we all can make it in. Studying to show ourselves a proof. Rightly to find the word of truth. Increasing our faith to envision our freedom, so we all can glorify our God. Standing in the gap. Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Make it in Make it in Make it in Want to hear him say good Good and faithful servant Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, the joy of love. Wanna hear him say good, good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say here to the joy of love. Wanna hear him say good and good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say here to the joy of love.